Hallelujah. Let me know when you guys are ready. Hallelujah. Good morning, good morning, good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Custom made it, custom tailored it just for you. If you're here today, this word is for you. If you're not here today, where are you? Where in the world are you? Where's Waldo? You better get him saved. <laughs> Hallelujah. Good morning. Good morning, those that are viewing on YouTube and Ustream. Hallelujah. Let's pray before we go into the word this morning. Is that all right? Yeah. Father, we just thank you as we're gathered together this morning in your presence, magnifying, glorifying, praising, and worshiping you for our great King. We thank you here that you've come and you've manifested your presence in our midst, O oh God. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you have written the word, you're the author, you're the teacher, and you're the one who speaks to us and gives us revelation. I thank you, Lord, that this morning that the word is not just information in our soulish realm, but it's life in our spirit, O oh God, that would cause us to rise to a new level, a new determination with you. Satan, we take great delight in reminding you that you are a defeated foe, that Jesus has stripped you of your authority. You have no power or authority against those that have been purchased by the precious blood of Jesus. So we just rebuke your distractions. We rebuke your lies now. We tell you, get under our feet where you belong in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. How many of you have been here for the teaching, learning from the life of Daniel? Amen. Have you been blessed by the teaching? How many of you were here for week one? Week two? Week three? Week four? Week five? How about week six? Today's week six. Okay. And today will be the last part of the teaching. It's only going to be a half a dozen long. You disappointed? You have your own Bible. You could study it. Amen. Learning from the life of Daniel, purity, diligence, and excellence. Amen? Amen. Purity, diligence, and excellence. We started out this teaching talking about David and his three friends. Remember? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Daniel. Daniel. Starts with a D. Daniel. Yes. And how they were brought into Babylon. They were brought into Babylon, and they were put in a place where the king gave an order for them to eat all this rich food. But they chose that they would not defile themselves with the delicacies of the king. Please understand that Babylon is a representation of the world. It represents the world. We as Christians need to make sure that we're not defiling ourselves with the things of this world. The things and the customs of this world that the world says is okay, that goes against God, we're not to be partakers of those things. So Daniel decided to set himself apart from those things. And the Word of God says because of that, because he didn't partake in the rich foods and the rich delicacies and he didn't do the things that that the rest of the world was doing. That they stood out. They were stronger. They were better looking. Isn't that interesting? That when they did things the way God says it, they became better looking. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're getting better looking each day. Well, let's think about this better looking for a second. Another way of saying they became better looking is they became more attractive. Are you attracting people to Jesus or are you repelling them? Amen. That must mean you're attractive, right? And they chose not to defile themselves. And then we were talking about in chapter 6 how Daniel had a spirit of excellence. He had an excellent spirit that... He was lifted up above the presidents and the satraps and all the other people, and he was set in the position over the entire realm, over the entire kingdom. How many of you want that kind of position and that kind of power? 
He went from a slave to a ruler. And you know, that's a common thread in the Old Testament. We look at Joseph, went from a slave to a ruler. Look at the children of Israel and Moses, you know. God wants us to come out of this place of slavery and to rule and reign in life. The word says that he wants us to rule and reign in life. Isn't that awesome? But in order to rule and reign in life, we need to walk according to an excellent spirit. Having an excellent spirit is doing things right. Doing things with diligence and not negligence. Being pure and unstained from the world. Amen? So those are, that's kind of a real brief of the last five parts. We're going to pick up with the last part today. And the last part is called, A Diligent Lifestyle Produces Fruit. Say a diligent lifestyle. Diligence is a choice. Diligence is a choice. Diligence does, just doesn't happen. You don't wake up one morning and poof, you're diligent. I wish. Wouldn't it be wonderful? We go to bed broken and stupid and wake up fixed and smart. It doesn't work that way. It has to be an act of our will. Say our will. It has to be an act of our will. And sometimes we will not to be excellent. What is our will? It's a term that's used a lot in Christianity. Jesus said, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Right? What is our will? Our will is the vehicle or the engine in which we make decisions based upon determination. Sometimes we will for the best, and sometimes we will for the worst. You ever see a child that just wants to do things their own way? You know, it starts off at one and two and three years old. You know, they get labeled strong-willed child. No matter what you do, uh -uh, I'm going to do it my way. And what you have to do with that child is you need to break that child's will. Right? We have a will. And before we got saved, our will was to do things contrary to the Spirit of God. We had a determination that we were going to fulfill every desire of self before we came to God. But now that we're saved, now that you're now temples of the Holy Spirit, now it's not our will, it's His will be done. We need to make these decisions based upon determination. In other words, having a goal, having a start having a middle, and having a finish, so you, as the Bible says, can finish well. Amen? In other words, it doesn't just happen by happenstance. You just don't happen to walk into the will of God and just accidentally walk in at your life. You have to be determined every single day and every single thought and every single decision. Is this the will of God? That's what causes people to rise to excellence. Amen? In other words, we can't live a lukewarm life, and we can't live a self-exalted life, and we can't live a life where, my, mine, mine, I'm going to do it my way, my way, my way. Doesn't work that way, people. Doesn't work that way. God laid it out in his book. He's king, and we're servant. And that will never change. He calls us sons, he calls us friends, but we still need to be obedient. Amen, and I know people don't like hearing that word, obedient. Well, the blessings come from obedience. Don't you want to be blessed? Don't you want your bills paid? Don't you want the best mate God has for you? Don't you want the best job God has for you? Don't you want the best pair of shoes? Whatever. Seek first the kingdom of God, his divine rule and reign, as well as his dominion, and then all things are added. Amen? It says in Ecclesiastes verse chapter 9, I'm sorry, Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10, it says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. That's an act of your will. Whatever you put your hands to do, whatever decisions you make, whatever you have to do, do it with all your might. You realize you have to serve God with all your might. He says, love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Another word for might is strength. We have to make sure that we are forcing ourselves to do what's right in his eyes. Because if we just set our Christian life on cruise control, you're not going to do it. 
If you're, not gonna go, if you're just going to go with the flow of what everyone else around you is doing, you're going to go with the flow downstream, not upstream. Amen? The word might here, whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might. The word might here is koak. And the root meaning means to be firm and vigor. Literally, it means force, to do it all your force. Figuratively, it means do it with all your capacity, all your means, and all that you could produce. It also goes on to mean with all your ability, all your ableness, all your force, might, power, powerful strength, substance, as well as your wealth. It requires everything you got to walk in the place of excellence, where no man could say anything negative against you. Just like Daniel in chapter 6, verse 10, I believe, they said they had to conspire to make up something about him because they couldn't find any real fault in him. Amen? Wouldn't it be great when you go to your review on your job and the manager goes, I ain't got nothing to say, you're great. Well, you know, you used up all your sick days and I know you weren't sick because I saw you on The Price is Right. <laughs> you know, it's a terrible thing when we find out Christians lie, Christians deceive. That is lack of excellence, right? And it gives a bad witness. You should be the very best in your family, the very best in your neighborhood, the very best on your job. You should be the very best in this church. If there's something that needs to be done, you should be first to say, I'm doing it because I'm the best. For God's glory, not my own glory. Amen? With all your heart, do it. With all your might, do it. Whatever you have to do, do it. Everything Daniel did was spiritual. And everything we do has to be spiritual as well. My dad used to say all the time, there's nothing natural going on. Everything that's going on in your life has a spiritual reason for it whether it's blessing or lack of blessing, whether it's healing or lack of healing, whether it's prosperity or lack of prosperity, there's a spiritual reason why you are in the place you are right now. Amen? Nothing natural going on. And we cannot deal with this supernatural spiritual life living in the natural. We need to be supernatural people. Turn to your neighbor and say, super. Natural. I'm going to get Sid Roth here in a minute. It's supernatural. Amen. Everything we do is to be a worship unto God. We talked about this. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Everything we do is to be a worship unto God. And if it is indeed worship unto God, it must be done with diligence, excellence, as well as joy. Amen? The joy of the Lord is your strength. If you're going to do it all your might, all your heart, the joy of the Lord is that strength. You need to do it with joy, not with a pickle puss on, not with a bad attitude. You ever see someone with a bad attitude? Yeah. It's not hard to miss, folks. <laughs> you know, my father always used to, say, used to say it to me when I was a little kid. You know, he'd want me to mow the lawn, and I didn't want to mow the lawn. I thought my brother should mow the lawn. He was older than me, you know. My father would say, fix your face. <laughs> fix your face. Fix your face. When you have a bad attitude, trust me, you need, you need some face fixing. <laughs> I don't mean plastic surgery. You need some spiritual surgery. Amen? So we need to do everything in the spirit, and it must be done in, with diligence and excellence as well as joy. Now, I'm not saying when we come together in church that we have to dumb down our praise and worship, right? We should be as fervent as now and even more. You see, like what we did this morning, there was life in the praise and the worship. There was an excitement. There was a joy, you know. There was a, this cohesiveness that took place, you know. And, you know, one person got excited. Another person got more excited because that one got excited, you know. And, we begin, and then God began to move, you know, and it's great. <laughs> and then we walk out the door and we go, You're supposed to keep it and take it with you. You're supposed to be like that on your job. 
unless you work in a library. <laughs> you know, that's not the good place for shouting. Unless you're the librarian, you might be able to get away with it. Amen? But I believe the Lord is calling us to intensify our worship out in the world. I'm not talking you stand on the hood of your car. Unless God calls you to do that. But our lifestyle is worship to God. The way we live is in worship to God. When you are pleasing to your boss or pleasing to your spouse, you're pleasing to God. And God gets glorified in that. Everything we do, we do for the glory of God, right? Amen. Thank you for that amen. I owe you a dollar. Matthew Poole's commentary. I don't usually use too much commentary, but this is good. Matthew Poole's commentary says, Whatsoever you find your hand to do. It says, What thou has opportunity and ability to do in the duties of your calling and in order to the comfort and the benefit, do with with all your might. With unweary diligence and vigor and exhibition or promptness of speed. In other words, don't delay. Do what you gotta do, and do it quickly. Whereby he again discovers that he does not persuade men to an idle and sensual life, but only to be a sober enjoyment of his comforts in God's fear and with an industrious prosecution the continuation of a course or action with a view of its completion of his vocation or calling. So, you know, when Samuel wrote this, I'm sorry. Solomon, thank you. <laughs> Drew a blank on that. When Solomon wrote this, he was encouraging you to walk in the fullness of what God has called you to do. Amen? Amen. Walk in the fullness of your calling. How many of you have a calling? We all have a calling. If the word of God says he called you out of darkness, you've been called. And if you've been called, you have a calling. Maybe your calling is not to be an apostle. Maybe it is. We don't know yet. But I guarantee you this. If you live your life in diligence and you're pressing into God and you're coming to the place of excellence, your calling will become obvious to others, to your leaders, as well as yourself. Amen? If you live a lukewarm, haphazard Christian life, that's what you get. Amen? Galatians 5.16 in the Amplified Bible says this. Galatians 5.16, you should be familiar. But I say, seek, walk, and live habitually in the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Spirit, responsive to and controlled and guided by the Spirit, then you will certainly not gratify the cravings and the desires of the flesh or of human nature apart from God. In other words, if we are truly walking in and seeking after the Holy Spirit in everything we do, the natural part of you will not control your life anymore. You will be a Spirit-controlled and a Spirit-led Christian. Isn't that the goal here is to be led by the Spirit? Amen? We can't be led by our own cravings and our own passions and our own desires. The Bible says they're corrupt. They lead to sin. We don't want to be living in sin. We want to be living in the place of righteousness. Can I get an amen? amen. How many of you like sin? Say amen. You all lied because each and every one of us likes sin. Our, our carnal man, our carnal mind, and our flesh love sin. The Bible says sin is pleasurable. Temporary, but it's pleasurable. If we didn't like sin, we wouldn't do it, people. But guess what? We need to walk in the Spirit because the Spirit doesn't like sin. Because it's rebellion against His very nature. In the flesh, we want to sin. Give me sin, give me sin, want to sin, 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 yeah. That's why we have to <laughs> kill flesh. Amen? Crucifying flesh. Have you ever crucified your flesh? Please understand that I was saying this Monday night, crucifixion was one of the bloodiest, gruesome types of execution that there ever was. 
That was a Roman thing. And when they would crucify a, a criminal, they would nail that criminal to a tree and they would put the crime over his head. Rapist, murderer, stole bubblegum, whatever. And they would, they would kill him. They would, they would literally let that guy suffer and suffer and suffer until he couldn't handle the pressure of it and basically suffocated by having his chest collapse. Okay? But we've seen the Jesus movies, and we've read our Bibles, and they took Jesus off the cross and they put him in the tomb, right? But they only did that because Jesus was a Jew. The non-Jews, the Gentiles, stayed up on the cross until their bodies decomposed and fell off. Because as the people would walk by with their children, they'll say, you see what happens when you do this, and you see what happens when you do that, and you see what happens when you steal bubble gum? So we're supposed to bring our flesh to a bloody, gruesome death. Stop playing with it. Stop petting it. It hates you. I threw that in for free. Amen? Jesus didn't die on the cross and raised from the dead so we could just be spiritual on Sundays. We ought to be spiritual 24-7. You could be spiritual in your sleep. You could have God-glorifying and spiritual dreams about Him. You could even have a divine dream that could be a revelation to the body of Christ to bring them to a new level. God could use you in a dream. That means 24-7 spiritual walk. It's possible, people. I'm walking in the Spirit and I'm sleeping in the Spirit, praise God. That, that's our goal. Amen? And here's the thing. The way you live your life while you're awake will determine how you live your life when you're asleep. The things you do in your day will dictate what you dream about at night. If you put your heart, soul, mind, and strength and affections upon God, what do you think you're going to think about? Cheeseburgers? <laughs> no, you're going to dream about spiritual stuff. Amen? So 24-7, because we are to walk and live in the Spirit, not just pay Him short visits. Right? Sunday is not God's day of visitation. Every day is God's day of visitation. Amen? And you're not visiting him. He's visiting you. If you show up on church on Sunday, you visited him. If you give your attention to him every day of your life, he's visiting you. Thank you, Rosie. I thought it was good. Amen. Hallelujah. Jesus didn't take the cross so we could just praise at church. He took the cross so our lives could be a praise to his name everywhere we go. That people could say, see that guy? Man, I want to be like him. You see her? Man, the boss just loves her. Right? We want to be envied for God's glory, not for self. Jesus didn't shed his precious blood and suffer imaginable humiliation just so we could preach anointed messages behind the pulpit. He took away our sin so our lifestyle can be the anointed message. Wherever you go, you're preaching. You're either preaching the kingdom of God or the kingdom of self. Wherever you go, whatever you say, whatever you do, you're a representation of what you truly believe. In the kingdom of God, there's believers and make-believers. Just like the Bible says, there's wheats and tares. Just like there's sheep and goats. They all grow up together, but they ain't all going to heaven. checking myself. Am I a sheep or a goat? How do you know if you're a sheep or a goat? Pastor Teresa said a long time ago, sheep go, yeah. Goats go, yeah, but. All credit to mom. Jesus died and rose so we could live for the glory of God in everything we do. Not only everything we do would bring glory to God, but we can do it wrapped in the glory of God. Amen? Daniel's life was a spiritual life. His life was a praise to God while he was in Babylon. His lifestyle was an anointed message. Check this out. 
So much so that he got the two most powerful men in the world, King Nebuchadnezzar and King Darius, to reverently fear God. This slave, because he had an excellent spirit, because he did everything with purity and diligence, got the attention of the two most powerful men in his world of that day and caused them both to fearfully turn to God. Let me ask you a question. Daniel had the Holy Spirit on him. You have the Holy Spirit in you. Do you believe you have that kind of influence? You absolutely do. Mix that with the divine favor of God that was upon Daniel's life. Because it was the divine favor of God that brought him to that place because the excellence and the diligence and the purity caused him to walk in the level of divine favor that he was recognized by the kings. Hey, Amen? You want to be recognized by the kings? And not just the Latin kings? Just saying. You know, talk about royalty. But why not? You already are royalty. Hmm. We'll talk a little bit more about this scenario in a second. You see, that's what we call lifestyle evangelism. He lived a life that got people's attention. He stood out from the rest. His excellence, because he honored God in everything he did, because he was a man of prayer who knew his God from the time he was a child up until about the age of 80, when this all took place in his life. He knew his God, he knew his customs, he knew everything about the word because he lived according to the word. He bowed towards Jerusalem when he prayed three times a day. He knew the scriptures, he lived the scriptures, he believed the scriptures. He didn't leave room for error. He got noticed, he got recognized, and he got elevated. He got promotion. Turn to your neighbor, when's the last time you've been promoted? Hey mom, when's the last time I've been promoted? Sorry. <clears throat> that was a joke, people. Okay? <laughs> That's right, June. I got promoted to a coat. Mantle, yes, mantle. <laughs> you were there, weren't you? Now listen. Because he got the attention of Nebuchadnezzar and Darius, two kings... Interestingly enough, the very reason that the wise men from Persia came to worship Jesus at his birth or when he was young in Bethlehem and bringing him gifts was because a man named Daniel heavily influenced their great ancestors in Babylon, Persia. Because Daniel had such an effect on these two kings, Daniel was spoken about through generation to generation to generation up to the birth of Christ, that these wise men came from Babylonia, Persia, to bring gifts to the king that Daniel prophesied about. That's influence, people. That's influence. Turn to David and say, that's influence. And that's heat. <sighs> Daniel's influence for the kingdom of God touches two of the world's most powerful empires, the Babylonian Empire from chapters 1 to 5 and the Medo-Persian Empire, chapters 6 to 11. His life affected empires. And we have so much more. We have such a better covenant than Daniel had. And we live manby-pamby Christian lifestyle. We don't want anyone to know we're saved. We're undercover Christians. Come on, people. Rise up to the prominence of your calling. Rise up. Rise up, oh people. Rise up. After his death, his influence touched the whole world for generations to come. Write these three words down. Purity, diligence, and excellence. If I believed in tattoos, I'd tell you to get it tattooed on you. But I don't, so use a Sharpie. Purity, diligence, and excellence. Let's talk about the unchurch. Say unchurch. The unchurch. 
Of course, nobody here is part of the unchurch. Will the unchurch win the world to Jesus? The unchurch. What do I mean by unchurch? You're probably saying, what's he talking about? The uneducated, the unhealthy, the unsuccessful, the undiligent, the unorganized, the unskilled, and the unfaithful. You think they'll lead the world to Christ? I don't think so either. Do you think Christians who are socially backward, financially lazy, physically sloppy, emotionally unstable, and are unreliable in everything, lacking diligence, lacking excellence, do you think these people can disciple nations? No, absolutely not. Some people even use their spirituality as an excuse to be negligent in their calling, right? Some people might think within themselves, or they might even say, oh, you know, I'm just so prophetic, and prophetic people just aren't good in other areas. Daniel was prophetic. Stop with the excuses. Like Daniel, let's not undermine the things that seem less spiritual, like our jobs, our educations, our health, our relationships, our family, etc. Let's be diligent in our responsibilities to be excellent in life. Amen? The more diligent and the more excellent we are in life and godliness, we will enjoy our godly life more. How many of you struggle with your walk? Be honest. How many struggle with your Christian walk? Some people struggle, and you know what? There's no need to struggle. The more we press into excellence, the more we press into consistency with God and consistency with our relationship, the more we become dependent upon the Spirit of God in our life, it'll cause us to live a more godly life. And it'll cause us to do it with greater joy. In other words, it won't be a burden to go to church. And it won't be a burden to show up to prayer. And it won't be a burden to read your Bible and pray. Because now there becomes a joy about it. It's no longer task. It always starts off as task. When you first got saved, the first thing people did to you, here's the book of John, start reading it every day. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know? But then all of a sudden you start to grow and, and God starts to speak and you start to re receive revelation with the understanding. And now all of a sudden you can't wait for God to show you something else. Right? But then something happens. Three or four years into it, well, I, I know this stuff. And you lose your joy about it. It goes back to being a task. It goes back to being a work. It comes back to that mentality, I got to do this, I got to do that. You don't got to do nothing. You are privileged and honored that you get to do it. You get to spend time with your God. It's not a task. It's not a burden. It's an honor to spend time with your God. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Mm -mm -mm -mm. So the more you enjoy your godly life, the less you'll enjoy sin. Praise God. The less you enjoy sin, you begin to sin less and less. Oh, thank God. That means you start to live more and more in purity. That means you can reflect God more clearly upon the world. That means your life will become more powerful and more fulfilling. Doesn't it sound like something you want? Let me ask you a question. Has any of this teaching pierced your heart? You know why? God wants you to be like Daniel. God would not have put him in the book if he didn't want us to be like him. And I've said it before. I said it in the past couple of weeks. Daniel is a type and shadow of Jesus. You know, but we, we think of Jesus, you know, we, we get this mentality of Jesus was some Superman. You know, Jesus was God. You know, yeah, absolutely, he's God. I'm not taking that away from him. You know, but we put this mentality into our Christianity. Well, I can't be like Jesus because after all, Jesus was God and I'm not. Now, we don't say it, but we think it. So we're looking at Old Testament type of Jesus who wasn't God. He was just man 
who is able to walk in excellence, who is able to live a life without spot and without blemish because Jesus is coming back for a Daniel church. He's coming back for an excellent church. He's coming back for a church that doesn't play and entertain with sin. He's coming back for a church that puts him first. He's coming back for a church who hungers and thirsts for righteousness and hungers and thirsts to know God and can't wait for God to bring the next revelation to them. He's coming back for a church who's intimate with him, who knows God intimately more than anyone else. He's coming back for a hungry church. Are you hungry, church? Oh, we're hungry. He wants you to be like Daniel. So this teaching, he's preparing you. These last six teachings, he's preparing you. He's preparing you. The times ahead, there's some great times ahead, but the Bible says there's some not so great times ahead. And they're not too distant future. Now let me just make a little disclaimer here if I can. How many of you know what your calling is? Raise your hand if you know your calling. Besides being a soul winner because that's everyone's calling. One. What God has called you to do. Everyone has a calling. How many of you know what your giftings are in Christ Jesus? How many of you know what your ministry gifts are according to Romans 12? How many know what gifts of the Spirit are operating in you? According to Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. Right? There are some of you here who might be called to be like a prophetess named Anna. How many have ever heard of the prophetess named Anna? Right? She's a, a female prophetess in the New Testament. Well, women can't be in the... <laughs> Anna, who was a widow after she lost her husband, dedicated her life to intercession where she fasted and prophesied and spent 24-7 in the temple of God. Maybe that's not your calling. And Anna would not be happy fulfilling running a business or being active in a marketplace like, like Daniel was. If Anna tried to be like Daniel, she would miss out on God's will for her life and end up being frustrated. At the same time, if Daniels, who are the movers and the shakers and the leaders in the world, try to be an Anna and try to fast and pray all day instead of going out into the real world and conquering and succeeding, etc., they too would be unfulfilled. You need to do whatever it is that God has called you to do. And God has called each and every one of us for a divine plan and purpose. It's up to you to find out what that is. How are you going to find it? How are you going to? I found it on the subway floor. How are you going to find it? I, I heard. Uh, I was reading something yesterday, and one of the one of the big revivals, the latter rain revival, the outpouring of the latter rain, which took place, I think, like in the in the mid forties. Ever hear of that? I'm sure Bev has, that it started with a woman who got her calling while she was faithfully making her bed. Just in prayer, she, she had children, she had a husband, and just while she was making the bed, God gave her the revelation and spoke to her where that revival came out of. Ended up building one of the largest churches in Detroit at the time. I forget, something, Refuge Temple, I believe. And, uh, you know, God has your calling. You need to find it. You may find it while making your bed. You see, the thing is, is she was making her bed with God. If you don't know what God's called you to do, you start by diligently praying about it. Praying with diligence. Do whatever God wants you to do. Ultimately, we all are going to be evaluated at the judgment seat of Christ based upon how faithful we were with what God has called us to do. We're all going to be judged for our rewards. What did you do with my giftings? What did you do with my callings? What did you do with my love? What did you do with my word? What did you do with sharing my love with others? Right? And God's going to reward us accordingly. This is not a judgment for hellfire. 
the believers aren't going to get judged to go to hell. They're going to get judged according to how many rooms will be in their house. <laughs> some of you will have mansions, and some of you might have a tent. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not the one giving out the rewards. Amen? Start by diligently praying about it. When you hear from God, then just do it with excellence and diligence. Right? Let's keep a life of humble purity before him. Let's see the divine favor of God come in greater measure upon your life. Don't write off the mundane as being unspiritual or unimportant. But be diligent and responsible in all your duties. 1 Corinthians 10.31 in the Phillips translation says, Because whatever you do, eating or drinking or anything else, everything should be done to bring glory to God. Amen? Did you receive something this morning? Did you receive something from this entire teaching? I want to encourage you to go through your notes. I want to encourage you to get the CDs. I want to encourage you to watch the videos on YouTube. Go into it. Meditate on it. How many of you know meditation is important? I'm not talking about, hmm. I'm talking about speaking the word of God over your life according to Joshua chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. God says when you meditate on his word day and night, throughout the day, from morning to night, throughout the day, and you don't fail to have the word of God coming off your lips, constantly speaking the word of God over yourself. The Bible says you make your way prosperous and you have good success. Amen. Amen. You want to be successful in life? You got to start meditating on the word. You got to start meditating on the teachings. You have to start meditating on the things that God puts on my heart to present to you guys because this is from heaven. This is not from Pastor Vin. I'm not that smart. God is. And he knows what we need as a church and he knows what you need as an individual at the time you're hearing it. Right? And now we have to also be cunning because the devil is cunning as well. So we need to be more cunning than him because immediately the devil wants to steal the seed from your heart. Immediately he wants you to be distracted. Immediately he's going to test you on what you think you learned so he can discourage you and say, see, that don't work. But you need to be more diligent than the devil because the devil, sadly, is a diligent devil. He works hard. Well, we sit back and get pedicures. Instead of having our feet on him, we're getting our toes polished. We're getting pampered. Hey, people, you're in a war. No, I'm, it's okay to get manicures and pedicures. That's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about in our attitude, in our Christian walk. You're in war. Why are you polishing your toenails? Hey, Amen? Last thing I'll say in closing... Me and Nada got to see a movie, Hacksaw Ridge. I don't know if anyone's seen that movie. What a phenomenal movie that was. If you haven't seen it, it's, it's a true story about a man who was a Seventh-day Adventist who was a conscientious objector to war. But he went because he felt called to serve for his country. I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but see it. It's, it's got some bloody scenes, but nothing too gruesome. We watch, pe we watch ISIS cut people's heads off, so this movie's nothing, you know? Go see that movie and see how God used this man, this young man. Awesome. Awesome. True story. Awesome. Amen? Can you give the Lord a praise this morning? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus, I have good news for you. Jesus wants you to live a life that is glorifying of his very character in nature. And because he loves us with an everlasting love, he loves us that he was willing to come and die and take your sin upon himself, that we could no longer be identified as sinners but children of God. Amen. If you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and either you're watching on YouTube or you're here today, you know, Jesus died for us he was buried in a tomb. He rose again victorious. And he wants us to be like him. The word of God says that we need to be dear imitators of God. 
We need to be Christian. We need to be Christ-like. In order to be Christ-like, you have to know who Christ is. Right? The Bible can be written, uh, I'm sorry, can be read like a novel. The only advantage is when you give your life to the Lord, you get to speak to the author of the book who can give you insight in what exactly was on his heart and on his mind when he wrote that. Amen? So if anyone here that would like to give their life to the Lord, if you haven't done so, just raise your hand. If there's anyone here that's never given their life to Jesus, each and every one of us here know the Lord. If you're watching by, by way of the video, just pray with me. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you as I am a sinner. Lord Jesus, I acknowledge that you died on the cross for me. You were buried in a tomb, and you rose again victoriously. Lord Jesus, I ask you into my heart. Fill me with your spirit. Forgive me of my sin. Make me your child. Give me the desire to know you. Give me the ear to hear your voice. Heal my disease. Set me free of all bondages. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that and you meant it with sincerity, something just happened. You might feel it. You might not. It's not based upon feeling. It's based upon faith, acting out on something that you don't know is there, right? But many times when people pray, they feel a burden lift. Sometimes they start crying. They don't know why. Whatever. Whatever your personal experience with God is, now it needs to grow. I want to encourage you to find a Bible teaching church. If you're in the area of Flesh and Queens, I invite you to come visit us. If you don't have a Bible, it's so important. You need to feed yourself spiritually every day. There's a number on the screen. Call me. I will be more than happy to send you a Bible, give you some instructions on how to use it. Thank you for watching. God bless you. See you next week. Give the Lord a praise. Amen.